Euphoria is an HBO drama series that deals with physical and psychological addiction around which revolve often unrealistically exaggerated struggles of high school students with formation of individual identity. Nate Jacobs is one of the main characters, a popular student that finds himself amidst a struggle between his violent persona, the Jesus good looks and status to do as it pleases, and his real shy self that wishes to free itself from within the confines of the personal shadow. The audience hates him, but I would argue that he's a good example of complex character writing, and the most misinterpreted character on Euphoria. I am of course not here to advocate Nate's behaviour. I think it's obvious to every civilised person what behaviour should be condemned, but to throw out the baby with the bathwater seems foolish. Nate Jacobs is not real. Nate Jacobs is a mystery. So who is the real Nate Jacobs? Let's find out together. In Season 2, Episode 7, in Nate's dream sequence, Nate is facing a mirror, but where we should see his face, we see his back. Ironically, this is a reproduction of the painting called Not To Be Reproduced. I truly love this painting because what it represents is the clash between our expectations and reality. If you look closer, the book in the painting is reflected as expected, but the person is not. This establishes that there is a set of rules in the universe by which it works and behaves. For example, mirrors reflect objects, but these rules are a mystery when it comes to the human being, the most mysterious element in our world, the bearer of consciousness, from whom the only thing we can expect with certainty is the unexpected. There is no set of rules by which to comprehend a person, by which to unveil his true character and grasp it completely. Our perceptions and expectations of an individual may thus be completely wrong or upside down, as is depicted literally in this painting. This is what characterises Nate Jacobs. Looking at Nate's background, the main source of his current issues is clearly his father, Cal, with whom he has a complicated relationship. Cal is a homosexual that hides it from his family and has secretive sexual encounters that he records and stores the discs of. At the age of 11, Nate discovered Cal's sex tapes and everything that went wrong with him seems to have stemmed from there. This is confirmed in season 2, where we learn a bit about Nate's background from his mother. She says that he was a sweet and caring boy up until a certain age when all of a sudden he became someone completely different and that she's still wondering why that might have happened. Now, let's unpack what happened there. At the age of 11, the child's consciousness has extricated itself to such an extent that it's aware of more complex topics, but at the same time is not yet equipped well enough to introduce order into them, so to speak. Some children are more resilient than others, of course, but at this age, children are still rather vulnerable to potential triggers of trauma, and sometimes even more so if they're more intelligent. So when Nate finds the tapes, he's unable to cope with the amount and severity of new elements introduced into his life unexpectedly. It is possible that this was his first visual encounter with intercourse. He discovers that his father has been cheating on his mother since forever. His father has sexual relationships with both men and women. He records encounters with these people. Possibly, Nate soon realises that his father does so without those people's knowledge or consent. Nate has to carry this burden of an overwhelming secret. This also changes his personality completely and initiates his alienation from others. Just as Carl Jung said, a merely private secret has a destructive effect. It resembles a burden of guilt which cuts off the unfortunate possessor from communion with his fellow beings. If you are conscious, and this is why they are so often diagnosed with ODD, or oppositional defined disorder, which is characterised by uncooperativeness, aggression, defiance and hostility towards peers and authority figures. 
The implication of his father's tapes is much more serious than it at first appears. Freud was certainly correct that sexuality is related to a vast number of personality issues. The problem with his theories is that he overlooked that this was just a part of the overall inner conflict that lies at the basis of humanity. The conflict between the material, dying world and the eternal, soaring mind. Everything bodily may thus appear lowly, and everything psychological noble. The fact that we have to eat and shit and pee while we can also think of the greatest and noblest marvels can wreak havoc on the soul, whether consciously or not. Therefore, the way we're introduced to sexuality matters as it becomes the basis for our future romantic relationships. Sexuality rises naturally in puberty via sexual and hormonal development, but how it's viewed can be influenced by external factors. Since Nate came across the tapes even before his puberty, a distorted image had been imprinted on him before any significant natural interactions could have occurred. There's a lot of evidence that exposure to pornography damages relationship skills, makes abuse seem normal, leads to insensitivity and lack of empathy, and increases aggression, and children are especially vulnerable to this. It's also important to appreciate that sex is generally perceived as a violent act by children. When a young Nate saw his own father engage in such, at the time, inexplicable and apparently violent acts, it created an association between relationships, physical contact, nakedness and violence. Seeing naked male bodies brings back the trauma. If his father touches him, he projects himself into the role of who he had perceived as a victim and acts defensively, that is, has an attack of aggression that stems from fear. All this completely corrupted the way he acts in the relationship and confused him in terms of sexuality. As we later see, this conflict is exacerbated when he falls for Jules, who is in fact a male, but at the same time takes all the boxes for Nate's ideal feminine. The persona prefers to remain dominant and thus seeks out someone it can keep dominating, without having to change. This dominance is also a mechanism perceived as a defense against what his father did in the tapes to other people. A fearful appearance often protects an afraid and confused inside. In the relationship he develops with Jules, we see something so different from Nate's persona that most think it must be a fake facade. But it's exactly here where we witness his true self emerging. Jules is the element that drives Nate's true self to come forward and transform the aggression, fear and resentment it's trapped in. This puts Nate in a very vulnerable position, which is why when he discovers that his father had a sexual encounter with her, it hits him right in the softest spot and reverts him back to his old vile shield. In season 1 we learn what Nate's ideal woman looks like. We see that it's a purely feminine image, almost a donor Angelic Carter. No body hair, lean figure, long neck, thigh gap, skirts, ballet flats, all purely feminine symbols. This image is in complete opposition to his father, his behaviour and his acquaintances. Until Jules, that is. And this is where the ultimate conflict is generated. He finds his perfect image in someone, but that someone at the same time is blemished by his father, and that someone is of course a biological male. But remember that anything sexual in nature and related to men is associated with his father. What now? Well, neurosis. Nate attempts to destroy Jules in order to break the bond between them on the outside but fails to do so on the inside. He becomes more obsessed, starts following her, watching her house. And once again, his dreams and fantasy provide us with true insight into his psyche. We'll come back to this later. Even the name Jules is in itself a hint. It originated either from the Greek eulos, which basically refers to soft hair, thus combining the feminine and the masculine, or the Latin Jupiter, that is, devoted to Jove Jupiter, the highest god of the Romans, the god of sky and thunder. The symbol of something soft and heavenly, but also rough and earthly is found here. And I think that's also the general atmosphere around Jules' character. Very down to earth and high in the sky at the same time. Combination of the male and female symbolism, touching androgyny. 
In the Bible, Nathaniel was the first to express belief in Jesus. Interestingly enough, he was skeptical about him at first, but despite his skepticism, he followed his friend Philip to meet Jesus. He then accepted Jesus as the Son of God, and Jesus told him that he will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In a sense, it's a story about coming out, no pun intended, of deceit and lack of faith, overcoming one's doubts and realizing the truth. Nathaniel means God has given or the gift of God. And what is ultimately God's greatest gift? We'd probably say love, but I'd say it's chaos and through that, the gift of choice. Because without chaos, there could be no order, no consciousness, no self-awareness and no option to choose order over chaos. Or speaking in more religious terms, no choice to return to love of God. And not even love could arise were there not something to oppose it. I think this represents Nate's overall role rather well. He drives forward the growth of all the characters around him, even though, and sometimes exactly because, his actions are harsh and cruel. The symbolism around Nate and Jules revolves around the sky, angels, earth and chaos, because they both must seek the right balance between heaven and earth, so to speak, and it may well be so that they need each other for it, but we have yet to see. As I mentioned, despite this image he seeks, he cannot maintain any relationship because of the aggression that covers his true repressed feelings. This is of course related to the complex and traumatic relationship with his father. Nate projects himself into the role of the people his father had sexual encounters with. We can see this when his father attacks him and holds him down, and later we learn that this is exactly what haunts him in his nightmares. Nate experiences this directly and has an attack of hysteria and aggression. This is because of various reasons. First, the father and the son always psychologically compete for dominance because the son is the next father. This is only well when the father assumes the role of a teacher and a friend and guides the son to assume healthy dominance in his own life, meaning learns how to take responsibility for his own life and how not to be a pushover. The father is meant to be the role model for the son and shape his identity, the proof of it being that absence of a father has often a significantly negative impact on sons. In this case, it's as if the father were absent. Cal basically disowns him because it's easier than to face the fact that he's the reason why Nate turned out this way. In this case, Cal is very troubled himself and takes it out on Nate instead of being a role model. In Nate's situation, the fight for dominance is emphasized because if Nate doesn't assert dominance, it's perceived as a threat to his entire persona, which then crumbles. He would become his father's victim. This can't happen lest the ego disintegrate, for which he projects this assertion of dominance pathologically onto every single one of his relationships. He's unable to assume power over his own life. Second, this submission can be seen as psychological castration. The most common response to this is aggression. Nate's persona is a strong male, and this persona is threatened by his father. It protects anything beneath itself that is true and could be exploited. He repressed this exactly because of the trait. What about Maddie and Cassie? Well, Obviously, Nate's issue with Jules is that she's actually a guy, and obviously what happened between her and his father. Cassie is nothing else but a substitute for Jules that appears more acceptable to Nate's persona, but not to his true self. This is pretty clear in the fantasy or dream sequence of Nate's in episode 2 and 7 of the second season. It's also clear that the way he describes her is inaccurate and actually describes Jules. Powerful, sensitive, creative, etc. As for Maddie, she's like Nate's persona in terms of personality. This is quite clear from the amount of conflict and aggression there is between them. Maddie is a convenient partner because the persona doesn't have to be erased, but can continue to exist and suppress the self. Transformation is always more painful and thus more avoided. But when Nate meets Jules, the self is prompted to rise, but due to the circumstances and the resistance of the persona, Cassie is sought as an alternative. This is however doomed from the beginning. So overall, Maddie's much like Nate's persona, whereas Jules is like Nate's true self, and Cassie is its easier to approach imitation 
that keeps the shadow untouched. Encounter with Jules threatens both his shadow and the fake persona, which are more comfortable to live with at this point than the self that has been hidden for years. As I mentioned before, the problem with Nate's aggression revolves around sexuality. In his case in particular, this father situation dammed up the energies of life, leading to an unnatural discharge of tension by our aggression. The only way to free this up again is through the development of the spirit, or intellect, and this is where Jules comes in. The conversations they have are real and honest. As Jung says, quote, There is nothing that can free us from this bond except that opposite urge of life, the spirit. It is not the children of the flesh, but the children of God who know freedom. End of quote. The life of the spirit must be rediscovered anew. The problem of an abuser is that he is his shadow's puppet. Nate reacts in aggression when his shadow is called out. When something he represses is pointed out by other people, he attacks. This is fairly common, albeit in Nate's case, the aggression is pathological and may lead to violence. Dream analysis. Most insight we are given into Nate's mind is through the dream sequences we are shown. Let's look at what they mean. First, all Nate's dreams and fantasies we've seen so far revolve around Jules, Maddie and Cassie and of course Cal. The common element we can identify in them is sexual relationships and intimacy. To briefly outline what's going on, there's a couple of things. First, Nate's desire for his father to vanish. This is because of course Nate blames him for Nate's shadow overpowering nature. This is a common occurrence, instead of facing one's shadow, the one who might have provoked it into existence is blamed instead, even though all they usually do is to show us a mirror. Clearly, his father is responsible, but unless Nate takes the position of power he seeks so desperately in his own life, rather than over other people, nothing will change. Given that he's traumatized, it would be of great benefit if he had some support structure, either in family or amongst friends, but he has neither, and that's why he spiraled down so deep. And that's how it often happens in real life too. Even resilient people struggle more if there is no support whatsoever. As I already explained the meaning behind the cow nightmare, I'll expand a little bit on the Maddie Cassie Jewel sequences. As I mentioned before, Nate's persona is tied to Maddie, so she's the desire to be who one is at the moment, without the need for transformation. Cassie always appears linked to Jules, and you'll have to excuse me for this example, but she's like vegan meat. When vegans crave meat, they buy a meatless substitute that may look like meat, but it never actually tastes like meat and lacks the specific amino acids meat has, for example. But it satisfies them because they convince themselves it's the right thing to do. In reality, they still crave the taste of real meat. The real meat here is Jules and Nate's dreams confirm this very clearly. Overall, Nate is quite a complex character and there's a lot around him that remains unresolved. I'd like to see more from him in season 3 and I do hope that his character arc won't be the cliché just punish the villain trope. I want to see some character development, please. Anyways, if you enjoyed the video, please do give it a thumbs up. What do you think about Euphoria? Would you like me to analyze it further? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.